know that. And uh, are you ready? Yes. All right. Well, we want to welcome all of you guys out there watching us by media. Amen. We thank you that you're part of our extended family. And we're going to continue today on our series of teachings that we're doing. Now, if you were not here last week, you have to get the CD or the DVD because I talked about my wife's deliverance and everybody wants to hear about that. You know, it's always good to cast the devil out of your wife. Now, see, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, so you're going to have to get the CD to find out what I'm talking about. But we're going to stay on that same theme, that same subject. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 17, please. Is that right? Yes, it is. 2 Kings chapter 17, Acts chapter 8, and then Acts chapter 19. We're going to read these scriptures here. I'll make some comments and then I will share with you today some things. And it's going to be a fun service because you're going to hear some things, but this is a serious subject. This is a subject that we must understand. Amen. How many agree with me that God wants to clean the church up? Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is not a condemning thing that I'm going to be sharing with you, but it's just, it's just a knowledgeable thing. You need to understand this. Is this principle is very important because we're entering into a day. Have you noticed now that Satan is trying to infiltrate your homes? Yes, yes I have noticed. Have you noticed that? Maybe you haven't noticed as hard as you should or you, you don't understand some things. Mostly that's what it is, not understanding. Did you realize a lot of the television shows that uh, your kids are watching are based on the occult world? Well, that won't affect me and my kids already has. You'd be surprised how much things affect you that you don't realize are affecting you. Could be something to do with sickness and disease. Could be something to do with health. It could be something to do in your life about not being able to open your heart up to the things of God. And you're afraid or you're fearful about certain things about the things of God. Or you're just not sure or you just kind of feel like you're in, you can't really break out. There's a lot of things that, that, that these things cause. Now, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 17, the Bible says this. They caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Everybody say amen. amen. Now, these are God's people. Yeah. You have to understand that. These are, he's not talking about the heathens here. He's talking about God's people. Now, let's go over to Acts chapter 8. Now, I read other scriptures last week, and I don't have time to go over all the scriptures, but these ones are, are good enough. We'll, we'll get what we need out of here. Acts chapter 8, let's look at verse 5. I want to point some things out to you in history, some things out to you that are happening here to make it real to you. Before I start reading, I want to say this. The Samaritans were Jews that compromised. Now, how many know that the Jews were God's people there? Yes. Say this with me out loud. Compromising Compromise. Say it. Compromise. compromise. That'll get you in trouble every time. God told them, do not mix with those heathens. I mean, he said it so many times in so many ways, and every time they mixed with the heathens, they got in trouble. And people ask, why did God, why was God so hard about that? You know, a lot of people think that God said, don't mix with races. That's not what he said at all. It had nothing to do with race. It was their practices that he said to stay away from. When I married Stella, some people got mad at me because she's brown. You know what I said? <laughs> I could care less what you think. If I married a black girl, it wouldn't offend God any. No. It might offend some of you, but it wouldn't offend God any. You know, it's just the house you're living in. That's all it is. It's at your house. I like brown sugar. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you're, it's maybe, you know, like, like Scott, he liked red hair. It's very apparent yeah. <laughs> to each their own and whatever, you know, I'm not saying I don't like red hair. I'm just saying I like the brown sugar there. <laughs> so, uh, he wasn't telling them not to mix with races like some of these white supremacist groups tell you. He was telling them don't mix with them because of their practices and their, and, their, and their evil practices and the things they do and the occult that they're into. Folks, let me tell you something about this. this I don't mean to, be, to freak you out or be vulgar. But in Babylon, when, they, 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 when, the, when the girls grew up, they had temples. 
And part of their uh, coming of age is they would go to the temple, quite frankly, and they would have, have to have sex in the temple yard. I'm just going to tell you what it was. And they would, the man that would, would, would choose to do that with them or whoever they hooked up with, I guess that's the terminology we use today, they would give them money and they would take that money and they would put it to their God. Now that was a rite of passage in a lot of these cultures that we're talking about here. And, and, and that's where prostitution came from. Because some of those girls got smart enough to figure if guys will pay them for that, then they started, you know, that profession. Yes, prostitution was born in occultism. You'll find almost every evil was born there. Almost all evil was born in some kind of practice of the occult world. So this is what was going on in Samaritan. Samaritans were Jews who mixed with these heathen cultures and were doing these abominable practices. This is why Jesus, um, you know, this is why the Jews thought they were no, no more than dogs, you know. Well, how many know God is merciful? And, and when the new covenant came in and, and, and God saved, you know, comes and, and, and he comes on the Jews and they all get filled with the Holy Ghost. The next people he deals with were the half Jews. The Samaritans who were hooked up with the heathens. And here's the story. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Everybody say Christ. Christ. And Christ is not Jesus' last name. The word Christ here means the anointed one and his anointing. The anointing destroys the yoke. God, um, the devil hates the anointing. Anything that's anointed, the gifts of the Spirit, the Word of God, uh, whatever it is, anything that's anointed, the devil hates it because that, that anointing has the ability to change you, yeah. to help you, to encourage you. Amen. Amen. And the people were of one accord, gave heed unto those things which, which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cried with a loud voice coming out of many of them that were possessed with them and were taken with palsies and the lame and they were healed. Now apparently a lot of these people uh, were possessed with evil spirits and uh, they were coming out. They were screaming when they left when he preached Christ in them. How many know that's awesome? What a spectacle, what a sight that would have been. And some of them apparently when those evil spirits left got healed of diseases and lameness and all kinds of things. I found that over the years. I found out a lot of people don't get healed until you cast the devil out of them. I, I know this one pastor. He happened to be a Baptist pastor. Okay? And they don't believe in this stuff. And he started getting messed up, hung around some care. You know, you hang around a slippery creek bank long enough, you're going to fall in. He started hanging around some people like me. And, you know, he found out some things, got filled with the Holy Ghost, and didn't tell anybody about it first. So he's over there in his office, and he used to preach this. Paul's thorn in the flesh was a sickness that came on you. And he says that was, the, you know, if you have a sickness and you're enduring that sickness and that, you know, whatever it is, that that's godly. Hang in there. Glorify God with that sickness. That's a, that's a doctrine. A lot of people believe that in the, in the church world today. But he believed that. And then he found out that it wasn't a sickness. It was, it was a, you know, a thorn in the flesh was what it was, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. Yeah. I got one of those. Amen. Everywhere you go, they try to keep people from listening to you, you know. Because yeah. he carried revelation. And so anyway, this pastor found that out. Well, he, when he had preached about that, 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 that thorn in the flesh being a, a blessing from God, one of his girls, his new girls that had just got saved in this church, Prayed to God and said, God, now she didn't know it. You can't pray to God a prayer like this because God won't hear that kind of prayer. But the devil will. She said, I want you to give me a thorn in the flesh so that I can be humble. And the second she did that, she began, she, within three weeks, she was paralyzed. She couldn't move and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And this pastor, when he found this out, felt responsible for that. All of a sudden he got some light. So he calls her into the office, and, and, she, and she's telling him, you know, about how, how wonderful it is to have the thorn in the flesh. And she's lying the whole time because, you know, I, I, how many have ever been sick? They say, you learn a lot from being sick. You know what I learned? I don't want to be sick anymore. That's what I learned. The only thing I ever learned when, the, when, when I got to, I'm sweating BBs as big as a baseball is I don't want to ever have that anymore. That's the only thing I ever learned out of that. Be honest about it. Would you want your children to be sick? 
God loves you a whole lot more than you do your children. I know this is hard for some people to receive, and I'm saying it for the sake of the cameras, because they've been rooted and grounded in this kind of occultic philosophies. Now, this pastor got mad when she started saying that. He jumped up and he said, you, you foul spirit that invaded her life through that, come out. When he did that, she jumped like that. And the next thing you know, he, she got up, took off running. Amen. She was totally healed when that thing left her. He caused it with his theology. Now, that's rough, isn't it? But I'm just, I'm saying it because I'm pulling out all the stops now so everybody can, we can clean the air of all this junk. Because if we're living in the last days, we've got to know who's doing what to you and where it comes from. Here, he started preaching Christ to them. These demons came out. People started getting healed. They started screaming. That's a cool meeting. <laughs> Verse 8. And there was great joy. Everybody say great joy. Great In the city, the whole city was, had great joy over this. I mean, you would too if you'd been bound up with evil spirits. Yeah. But then there was a certain man named Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was someone great. Now, this is a very famous man in history. You can look him up on the internet. His name was Simon Magnus. He was one of the fam most famous satanic occultists in the history of this planet. And he apparently had this whole area under his control. Boy, he was making money. Can't you believe he was making money off of them? And because he was an occultist and he, was, he had them all under his spell, because of that occult worship and all the things they were doing, they got demons in them. Now, I know this is heavy, but this is the way it works. They didn't know. They might have been good people. Some of them may not have known that, that you know, it was wrong to do this or whatever. But nonetheless, the enemy took advantage of them. So Jesus comes along, start, or uh, uh, Philip comes along, starts preaching Jesus to them. They start getting set free. There's great joy. And how many know this guy, Simon here, is probably not digging this much? Verse 10, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because of a long time he bewitched them with his sorceries. Everybody say this with me out loud. He what? Bewitched them. Put a, he cast a spell on them. He confused them. How did he do it? With his sorceries. Now, a lot of people are confused in the body of Christ because they're actually knowing or not knowing involved in sorcery. Amen. How can that possibly be? I'll tell you in a minute. Just relax. But when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondering, beholding the miracles and signs which, which were done. When the apostles, were, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they, came, they sent down unto them P Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them. How many know they were already saved? What did they pray for them for? That they might receive the Holy Ghost. See, there's two separate experiences. People need to know that. Because the empowering of the Holy Ghost is the very first thing that the, that the apostles look for after salvation. Because they knew people, especially in that area, needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost because a lot of them had just been filled up with the devil. Now you need the Holy Ghost. How many of them know when the devil leaves, the Holy Ghost needs to come in, right? Well, anyway, to make a long story short, this guy was observing this. Now look at this. Verse 17, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Amen. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. How do you see the Holy Ghost? You ever ask yourself that question? Uh, they were speaking in tongues. We know this from church history. Just like they were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. Verse 19, saying, give me also... This power that whomsoever I lay hands on may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, you know what he was thinking? I can make more money off of this than I ever could off that other stuff. And Peter swings around. Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that, they may, that the gift of God may be purchased with money. How many know you can't buy God's gifts? Amen. Right? Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For the sake of the, of the CDs and the, and the DVDs and the TV, Please make a note, circle the word matter there, put a line out, and put utterance, because that's what it should have been translated. Just look it up. Get a concordance and look it up. You'll find out that it's translated many other places, utterance. Thou has no part in this utterance. In other words, when they were getting filled with the Holy Ghost, 
They, they were, some of them were, they were speaking in tongues. Some of them maybe they were prophesying. Things like that were happening. You have neither part nor lot in that. You know, he was talking about them because of his attitude, right? Amen. Repent, therefore, and so on and so forth. And, and, and so we see here, folks, that the, this city was filled with people that were filled with the devil. Because of the occultic practices and the man who really had power over them named Simon Magnus, which was a, a well-known occult figure. They practice all kinds of witchcraft and different things. Now, let's go over to Acts chapter 19 real quick, and I'll read this, and then we'll, we'll make some comments here. <clears throat> In 1990, the Lord spoke to me and said, the, the Lazarus generation, this last generation, is going to begin to take on the same type of thing that happened to the hippies. The hippies in my generation, uh, remember them? They began to use drugs, didn't they? They opened the door to the drug use in America, pretty much. The expanding consciousness, you know. And when they did that, you know, that, that opened them up to all kinds of devilish things. And there was preachers that were warning people back then, I remember even, that drugs was going to become a major issue. But most people, even in the church world, said this is not going to be a big issue. It's just a passing phase. Now, we look back on that today, and how many know it wasn't a passing phase? This became a plague in society like we have never seen. Now, the Lord said to me in 1990, he said, this generation today, because of the influences of the occult on our children and on everybody else, through TV, through whatever it may be, and we'll talk about those things here as we go, he said, he said, by the time 2020 comes, he said, you will find out there will be thousands and thousands of people in America that are literally under the power of the devil walking down the streets like zombies. And we're starting to see that. When I go out to certain areas and cities and I get in these prayer lines, people are, it's vile. When I talk to people on the telephone, when they email me, you see the things that people are practicing. Now, when Tim comes to speak to you, he'll shock the fire out of you about some of the things they're doing. One of the, I, I can't get into all of it. We've got a mixed crowd here. You know, I, I, I'm a little hesitant to say some of the things. But folks, <clears throat> the, the young people today, the goth, how many know what the goth is? You know, twilight and goth and vampires and all. Oh, that's just, you know, that's fun. No, what that is, is a is Satan desensitizing people and allowing the occult world to slowly move over into society is something that's to be grasped. And a lot of young people are grasping that. And what happens is you cannot, right, say this with me out loud, you cannot. Doesn't matter whether you know it or whether you don't know it, but you cannot hook up with something to do with the occult and not be affected by it. Amen. Even horoscopes. Amen. Nothing. Ouija boards nothing. You do an Ouija board, it's just an open door. It's one of the biggest satanic tools in Satanism. They use it all the time in their rituals. Now, <clears throat> last week I, I went to the scriptures and showed you about the unclean thing that came into the camp, the cursed thing that cursed them. I'm not going to show you that today because I don't have time. But how many know occultism and, and occult people can use things like lucky charms and fetishes and potions and all this kind of stuff. Well, that carries demonic power. And even some symbols carry demonic power. All over America and around the world, I've seen this. Now we're going to see that. Let's go to Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. Everybody say disciple. What's the first thing he preached to them? It's really interesting. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? <laughs> <laughs> How many know that's important, see? They said, we have never even heard so much as there was a Holy Ghost. He said unto them, unto which were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. Then, then said Paul, verily John baptized with repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who come after Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Amen. And all the men were about twelve. So he has a church going, twelve men. And he, he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the thing concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way, before the multitude he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. And this continued by the space of two years. Everybody say, two years. Look up at me. This city was foul, man. 
everybody was involved in some kind of a cult form worship. Cults, the occult, Satan, whatever. You know, this just, I could tell you story after story about the different ones that were there. And the practices were just really not very good. They believed, like Americans do today, some of them, that bisexuality was okay. Homosexuality was fine. They began to drift over into that area. And they were practicing a lot of that. There was male prostitutes in the temples as well as female prostitutes. So they were practicing all this. So Paul, how many know he was up a lot against a lot there going in there? Yeah. Some of them didn't listen. Some of them did. He's preaching. Now notice verse 11. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons and diseases departed out of them and evil spirits went out of them. Look up at me. How many know that's pretty wild? Here's an apron or some kind of a cloth that the Apostle Paul would wear on his body and the anointing that was on him would go into that cloth. And when they take that cloth somewhere and they would put it in one of their people's homes, the evil spirits would come out of them because of the anointing. It destroys the yoke and the people were healed. Now why did God do that there? That's interesting, isn't it? Why would God do that? I'll tell you why. Because the occultists practice that kind of stuff. They would send you home. You would go there like the witch doctor. You'd go into the temple. They would send you home with some fetish and say, you know, do this. Put it under your bed. Attach it to you. They were doing all of that for theirs. And, and so God upped them. Everybody say amen. Because when, when, when they got something from Paul, it actually worked and actually destroyed the oak. And those demons would leave. That's why God did that. Now, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons, one of Sceva, a Jew, and a chief priest, which did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, but how are you? who are you? <laughs> how many know that's not good? And I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who in the world are you? Now, see, you have no right to use the name of Jesus if you're not in the family of God. But if you are a child of God, you have a right to use the name of Jesus. Amen. Believe me when I say this, Satan's afraid of the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you understand that the power there is in the name of Jesus, he knows it. And if you don't, he, he knows it too. So there's great power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Verse 16, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them. So they were fled out of the house naked and wounded. Apparently what he did is he ripped all their clothes off. Then he wounded them somehow and kicked them out of the house. How many know that's not a real good exorcism? Now the reason that they had Jewish exorcisms going on is because they had problems in the area with demons. And this was a big way, way to make money. And so they would go in there and they, they, they had a thriving business. Ghostbusters, you know, they would go right in there. This is what this was all about, folks. Now, verse 17, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of Jesus was magnified. Now, notice verse 18, very important. Here's, here's the point. Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them, or their, the stuff they used for the occult practices. Amen. They burned them. Both all men, kind of the price was uh, really uh, millions of dollars. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Everybody say amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now here we see when God started moving, the people were moved to get rid of their occult items because apparently Paul was preaching to them. You got to get rid of that stuff because it's that stuff that brought these evil spirits into your life and into your houses and so on. Now we all know this. Can an object carry with it demon power? The, the answer to that is absolutely. The answer to that is Yes. I remember Lester Summerall talking about a situation one day because he was in a Bible school and they had a Bible school and uh, the students were real alert and they were enjoying their Bible classes and then one day everything changed. All the students, it kind of looked like in here sometimes, all the students were falling asleep and people couldn't stay awake and they were getting drowsy and they couldn't seem to wake up and it was just like they were under some kind of, something was going on. So they began to pray about it. I said, Lord, what's going on around here? Well, what had happened is one of the students who went on a mission journey and brought back a little Buddha belly doll or something, put it in the corner. You see, demon spirits are in them little things. People worship that. It's not the thing. It's the demon spirit that's behind it. When they got that out of there, that all stopped. Now, I, I could tell you so many stories. So I will tell you some stories. Are you ready for this? Yes. Pastor Tom, you're kidding me. You mean to tell me that an object can, can, can do that or something in our house or a TV show or a certain type of video or any of that kind of stuff? You mean, you know, if you watch Charmed or the ghost, what is it? 
yeah, ghost, you know, charmed or the ghost whisper. You get two things going on there. You, it's the guys with hormones shouldn't watch that. And then number two, uh, you get demons in your home. Well, you know, porno is one of the ways. Porno is one of the best ways to get into your home. I just let that sit there. If you're watching porno, the devil will come in and you can bind loose and everything else and he'll stay there. You can't override one principle of God and ignore another. Look at your neighbor and say, this is better preaching than your amen in today. I know this is tough, but you need to hear this. This is tough for some people to hear. I preach this all over the world. I preached it to millions, hundreds of thousands of millions of people on TV in Panama. That was fun. You know, I've seen the comments here getting back on that. You know. But anyway, so here's the deal, folks. I remember one time, I, in fact, we got people in this church right here, Norman and Lynette, sitting right back there. I preached this one time in church here, and they came up to me, and they're pretty new Christians. And they had a lot of problems, a lot of issues going on in their lives, you know. Basically, I think Normie was dying. He was going over to the Mayo Clinic. Is that right, Normie? And had a bad heart and had uh, all kind of stuff. And different things were going on in their life that weren't good. And Lynette had a lot of sicknesses and all kinds of things. So I went over there, you know, and they asked me to come over. And I sit down with Norm, got all filled with the Holy Ghost. And that, how many know that gets you every time, you know? Life changes forever. Norm and Lynette, all of a sudden, they're on fire for Jesus. And I said, and, and so I preached this kind of thing one day. And they came to me and said, Pastor Tom, will you come over to our house and go through everything? We want to make sure and get rid of everything we might have. So I went over there. And sure enough, you know, there was a lot of stuff. They had like a Native American stuff, you know, Indian, Native American stuff. You got to really wash it. And all this stuff. So anyway, we cleaned it all out, you know. And as much as we could, and we threw it away. Well, from that point on, their whole lives changed. There was healing in their body. Their marriage came back together. Amen. What else happened? Oh, they got all their debts paid off. Wow. Now I got most of your attention. Glory to God forevermore. <laughs> you talk about money. Huh? Really? <laughs> Well, it doesn't work like that all the time, but I've seen that work like that. It was, it was, the fact was that they just operated in the principle that, you know, when you do that, blessing can come into your home, oh, yeah. see, right. instead of all those other things that are, you ever been in a home where there's strife? It's like an atmosphere is there. A lot of times that's caused by something that you watched or something that, you know, it, these, these evil spirits get access to us and, you know, uh. Some of those things, some of those things, you know, it's, it, it just depends on the person. But, you know, fear and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Comes in. All right. Well, let me tell you some other stories. I got, I got a, a lot of these things. Uh, there was one uh, story I got to tell you about. I, it wasn't my story. But there, there was a couple. They had a young uh, a child, nine-year-old girl. And they, they dropped her off at the grandparents' house. And she came back. When they, she came back, she looked like a zombie. This is a true story. And they couldn't figure out what, what was wrong with her. All she could say is, I don't want to go to the black room anymore. And so they tried to get this girl to be, uh, you know, start, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to help her go to bed, you know. So she, she was like standing there like a zombie. They didn't know what to do. They, so they had to undress her and, and try to put her in bed and all this. And when they started to undress her, she went completely, she fainted and fell out and started talking about the black room when they tried to undress her. So this is all ringing bells. It would with me. What's going on here? So and they found out when they undressed her, her body was covered with bloody designs, bruises, burn marks, and a pentagram down her chest in blood. Now, there, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out something bad happened here, what is going on here. But they, didn't, they weren't believers. They didn't know anything about what to do. Her wrists were torn and burned and bruised like she had been tied up. So they took her and, and they, and, and, and I forgot to tell you this, her arms, they looked at her arms and they, she had needle marks in her arms where they had drugged her. So they took her to the hospital. Of course you would too, wouldn't you? I hope. They took her over to the hospital. But she was comatose. She went into like this coma. And the doctors, you know, examined her and they confirmed she had been sexually molested. They confirmed the whole nine yards. Well, to make a law, she, you know, when the nurses came in and tried to take her to the bathroom, she'd start screaming and having a fit about the black room, the black room. Well, they found out that their grandparents were involved in Satanism. And so they were trying to, uh, uh, you know, break off all contact with these people. 
And, uh, the, you know, the police went to their, uh, to their grandparents, and grandparents said, no, it's them. They, they, they abused their children. The whole bit. They got put back on them and all this. And the coven was coming against them and all this kind of stuff. They found out real quick. How many know when you're thrown into something like that, you need to find out about spiritual warfare real quick? And you better not go to the Catholic Church. So anyway, they tried that. It didn't work. They had to go to the, to the other, the full gospel people, finally. Amen. You always end up over here when you get needs like that. And, and, and so anyway, to make a long story short, they were able to get some help. But they tried to break off family relations. But those people would follow. They claimed what had happened is that, that the, the cult, the, the group that this man was in, paid off. His business was in big, big danger. He made, a, he made a pact with the devil. And they paid off all of his debt and gave him money. And what they did is they said, the only thing is we want your granddaughter for our purposes. So he actually traded it. Can you imagine such a thing as that? No, I'm a grandfather. I'm a grandfather. I can't believe anybody would do that, but he did. And so his deal was, he had, and, and he, they knew if we don't do this, they're going to kill us, basically. This is the cult world for you. They will kill you. They will kill you. And you'll disappear, and nobody will know why. You'll just disappear, see. And so anyway, he, he, he kept trying to get the, that kid back because they put spells and stuff on her to try to get her back in the cult. So he, they would sneak in there, try to get in the house, and they would leave these little articles, little needles and stuff. And when they would, all hell would break loose in the house. They couldn't figure out what was going on. She'd go nuts, they go nuts. They're arguing, they're, they're, they're fighting, all this stuff's going on. And finally, the guy came over, Pash came over, who it was, and helped him find what it was and got it out of there. So don't tell me that things can't carry demon power, because they can. Amen. See, they had prayed over these items to put a, cast some kind of spell. Anyway, not too long ago, uh, I was in uh, establishing a church in Oregon. I was flying from Reno, Nevada to Oregon. And a, a new church, you know, new people. And uh, there was a couple there, uh, or uh, excuse me, a grandmother there that told me, can you pray for my, my grandson? I said, well, what's wrong with your grandson? He sa she said, he, they threw him out of school because uh, he, just, he goes to school and he starts kicking and screaming. And it's so bad, he kicked people and he, and he, and he picked up a desk and hit the teacher with it. And it's a 10-year-old, 9-year-old kid, just a young kid. And they finally had to kick him out of school. They could not, and they, they, and they took him and diagnosed him as HD double 40 and all that stuff, you know. Started putting him on dope. And uh, so she says, you know, I think he's demonized, you know. He becomes like another person. He'll look at you and the eyes will roll up and he'll growl and curse you like a dog and all this. And, you know, the psychiatrist and everybody just say he's got, you know, bipolar double D. And so I said, no, I can't pray for him. And she goes, what? Aren't you a man of God? I said, I can't pray for him. You don't understand. His family, his, his parents do not come here. If, and they're going to have to ask me. Because the parents have authority over the kids. Jesus never did a miracle without the parents' permission to a young people. Look at, look at it and check it out in the Bible. You'll see that. You never override anybody's authority. So if you've got a lot of evil in your home and you're a parent, what's going to happen is, is that God himself can't help you until you make a decision. You want to get that stuff out. And as a parent, you have a lot of authority. What you say, what you do. So anyway, I said, I can't, you know, I, go to his pastor. Well, his pastor, they did go to his pastor. Well, he told him to go to the psychiatrist. Now, this is a full gospel person. But the problem is, this full gospel doesn't mean anything anymore. That's the problem we're having. It's, a, it's word. It's a term. You know, it's, it's another term. So, you know, it was, I don't tell you who it is. But anyway, so finally they came over at, to the church and they started pleading with me to come over there. Listen, please, we need help. We know, we're, we'll, you know, we just need help. We can't, nobody's helping us. Can you help us? And I said, well, okay. Will you do what I told you, ask you to do? They said, yeah. I said, because said, if you don't, then I can't help you. I will not pray for him unless you do exactly what I tell you to do. They said, we'll do anything you tell us to do. I said, anything? I said, it, c it could cost you a lot of money. And they're thinking, I'm going to ask them for money. Because they think I'm one of those. I said... I said, no, I'm not going to ask you for any money, but it could cost you a lot of money. 
Because if I go over to your house, we're not going to pray for him here. I got to go to your house and I got to go through your house. And everything I tell you to throw out, you got to throw out without any questions. Amen. Or I will not pray for your boy. Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? To their credit, they told me, well, it's not going to do me any good, folks. You understand what I'm talking about? It will do no good for me to do anything uh, to that, uh, to pray for that boy because the parents have authority and if they're bringing that back in, it's just going to get worse. Jesus said don't do it unless they're ready because it'll get worse. There'll be seven more come back or whatever. Bring their friends and everybody else. So I'm sitting there and I had to be tough with them, lovingly tough, you know. To their credit, I tell you, these people were refreshing. We'll do whatever you say. We went over there, we're throwing everything out. Man, all kinds of stuff. You know, they had a Pokemon and they had, let's go down the, the you know, uh, Ninja Turtles and, and uh, they had occultic things like that, you know, that for the kids and, and all this stuff in the bedroom and the blankets with the, you know, the, uh, what do they call those uh, ponies with the noses? Unicorns and and everything else, and all kinds of occultic symbols, and jewelry, and different things. You know, the, the, the unk cross, and the, you know, uh, all of that kind of junk. The, the, the lightning bolt. And all of these satanic symbols. Well, people don't even know what they are. They're used in ritual occults for years and years through the ages. And we threw all of this stuff out. Probably three or four thousand dollars worth of stuff. And at the time, I had left because I had to go get on an airplane. I had to drive an hour and a half to the airport. I had to get on an airplane. An hour and a half. I looked at the clock. I had 15 minutes. I said, man, I don't really want to tear into a bunch of devils. It takes more than 15 minutes. Most of the time, get you know, rid of all these things. But I just said, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this. And I walked in the room where the boy was. I hadn't met him yet. I walked in the room. That boy f started manifesting right there because the devil knew. I said, now listen, I take authority over the strong man and every other demonic force inside of you. I command all of you to go. You got to go in Jesus' name, just like that. And I walked out. That's all I could do. Did you know that boy got progressively better and better and better and better and better and became totally normal? Amen. Glory to God forevermore. But if his parents would not have done what I asked him, they wouldn't be normal. They'd probably be in a mental institution today. Why? Because of the stuff they had in their home. Say it with me out loud. The stuff they had in their home. Now this is heavy for some of you, isn't it? You ever wonder why there's so much sickness in the body of Christ? You ever wonder why people seem like they can't get anywhere spiritually? You ever wonder why people are in and out and back and forth? You wonder why so, there's so many marriages failing and strife in people's homes? This is one of the reasons. People have no clue. You know how I know that? I have a Facebook page. Yeah. I got 3,000 something. I don't know. There's, there, every time I come over there, there's this big list, you know. So I don't know who they are. I don't care. It's just for me to minister to them. You know, that's all that Facebook. I could, wouldn't even do Facebook if it wasn't for that. Yeah. A couple of my old high school friends got saved filled with the Holy Ghost, got messed up on my, my, my Facebook page. Wonder what Tom's doing. Hmm. They found out. And you know what? That's awesome. Everybody say amen, even if it was just for that. But I get, you know, all these reports back. But I, I don't know all these people. But I watch these little, what are they calling things? Posts? Yeah. You know, and these people on my Facebook page, I, I always look at them. Most of them are Christians. Most of them are Christians. They all, they, you know, it says Christian on there. And, you know, Christian and Christian. And so I'm watching the, you know, the Christian. And then, you know, they have the horoscope. And they're playing the, whatever it is, you know, the, the Ouija's or whatever. And I can tell you for a fact that when I start talking about this, the atmosphere gets real thick like it is in here right now. Amen. Can I have one of those, brother? Yeah. Anybody like Altoids? <laughs> They're good. Anyway, so the atmosphere gets real thick. Why? Because I think when people first find out about this, they don't believe it much. They think, how can something like that have an impact on my life. I mean, I love the Lord and I'm serving Him. How could some kind of article or clothing? Well, these people did, these people apparently understood the principle because they started bringing that stuff and they started burning it. And when they did, the Bible says that the Word of God prevailed and they had a giant revival in that place. In fact, we know from church history that pretty much the whole city got saved. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Well, Pastor Tom, we don't have a problem with this in Sturgeon Bay. Well, well, 
I was talking to a young man over here. I was praying for him the other day. And he was, uh, he was telling me about how the, a church over here that uh, supposed to be, I don't know, full gospel, independent, whatever it is. And uh, that uh, the, uh, the pastor over there was having the kids, the youth group, play the Ouija board. And I couldn't believe that. You know, I thought, nah, that, come on. Come on. Now, I've heard a lot of weird stuff. But that, you know, right? I don't accept all these things people tell me sometimes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You know what else? So, uh, you know, he said we played that and we started getting into the occult and getting books and stuff. And about 10 of us formed a little coven over here in Sturgeon Bay. And so we were dabbling in Satanism. And he said, what happened? I said, I said, he said problems just came. And he was telling me about his problems. And I prayed for him and so on. But all the kids set for him ended up in jail. All of them are in jail right now. They're all in jail. In the clink, in the penitentiary over here in the jail. And I said, well, I don't know about that. So I went over to a couple of our other families who come from this place. And I asked them, oh, yeah. Now, folks, that's ignorance gone to seed. I certainly wouldn't want anybody laying their hands on me in that church. Now, that's been confirmed. I, I, I told another pastor about this the other day. They about fell out of their chair. They couldn't believe that either. I said, well, you know, this, we're living in the last days. And so you can't, you know, who can you trust? Who can't you trust? But, you know, everybody say this with me out loud. We've got to keep stuff out of our house. Say it. Keep stuff out of our house that will bring demons in. Now, I don't believe in demons. Somebody is always out there always says, I don't really believe in demons. I, my pastor told me that that was just allegory stuff. And I tell people who don't believe in demons, they probably have them. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. So anyway, everybody say amen, okay? Amen. So uh, I got to tell you one more story. I was, I, I, uh, I had a, a friend who came from a, the, the, the most popular, one of the most popular word-oriented Bible schools in America. He worked with, 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 with a person that I consider my spiritual father. And this guy's a spiritual guy. And he came to Reno the same week I did. And he took over a church and I started a church in Reno, Nevada. We became close friends. But he didn't understand anything about really about spiritual warfare. Because all of a sudden his wife started getting sicker than a dog. She ended up in the hospital. She almost died about three times. And finally he got desperate and he came to me and said, Tom, what's going on here? And he, said, he says, you know, I came into my office the other day and he said, man, there's chicken feathers and a dead chicken on my, you know, they broke in and they put it on my office and all this. I said, welcome to Reno. <laughs> I said, brother, you can't pray like you guys. I've been to your prayer meeting. You guys down there, you pray 15 minutes or whatever. You think that's enough. You don't, you don't, you don't get in the spirit and travail and pray because I said, this is Reno. This is not Tulsa, Oklahoma. I said, this is different up here. I said, there's, the demons have ruled the roost here for years. And I said, man, me and my wife, we had to battle all this stuff, you know. And I'm telling you what, it was a wild thing. Did you know the oppression and, and a lot, in a lot of ways is stronger here than Reno, Nevada? Yeah. Did you realize that in Sturgeon Bay and Sister Bay, there's these generational satanic cults? Yeah, for real. Did you realize that? Did you realize that many of the, uh, the people who are participating in that sit on some of the church boards? Yeah. Really? Yeah. But see, when an area is as religious as this area is, that's what you have. Because the devil doesn't mind you being religious. He just don't want you to be a Christian. Did you hear what I said? Go to a church. Be like all the rest of them. You go to church. You go out. You have a meal together. We love God. We go home. We don't make any problems. We go to the church picnic. I, Pastor John and I were driving one day when he was here. And I said, look, look at the sign over here. This is, and uh, we pulled up by this sign. He couldn't believe it. It says, uh, such and search church picnic sponsored by Bud Light. Yeah. <laughs> And he, he, he was laughing. He thought that was a boy. He's taking pictures of that and putting it on his Facebook page. And, and see, that's, that's the spiritual climate that we have here because, see, Door County, they're good people. They're moral people. They love God, so on and so forth. And they go to dead churches. And Satan don't mind 
when you go to a dead church because when you go to a dead church like that, you become dead. What happens is, is, is you become like all the rest of the religious people who drive around with a Jesus bumper sticker on their car that holds, most of them are holding their car together. It says honk if you love Jesus or something like that and think that you're really being a Christian. And how many know that there's much more to Christianity than that? Let me say it to you this way. You're anointed to do things for God. You have a powerful anointing on your life. Everybody in this room. You have gifts, you have talents, you got things on the inside of you that you have dreams that God has given you. And not, normally they're not going to come to pass unless you get in there and find out the spiritual principles that you can use and, and take authority over these things that are trying to hold you back from reaching your full potential. My job, the reason God sent me here, he, should have, he could have sent me anywhere. The reason he sent me here was because we got to break the power of this silly occultic devil and religious devil up here so we can have a move of God up here. And we're starting to have an impact now. We're not there yet. We're starting to have an impact. And you know, it's been 13. How long have I been here now? A long time. Boy, I mean, we prayed and fasted and prayed and sought God over this thing. I'm telling you, honest to God. And there's been some battles in the realm of the Spirit. It's a battle royal over people's souls. Because everybody up here thinks they're okay. I'm okay. Are you really? Yeah. I was confirmed. Baptized when I was a baby. I'm on my way to heaven. Thinking like that's not very good. You know what that is? That kind of thinking tells me that there's a spell on you. Remember when Paul wrote to the Ephesians? He says, who has what? Bewitched you. He didn't use that term as a, some kind of a strange term. He was asking them, he says, somebody has done something, this occultic thing, in, because you guys have turned away from grace and you're trying to go over there and get, you know, under the law again. And the only way that could happen is you're confusing your minds because somebody put a spell on you. Can I use that term? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing that. I put a spell on you. People don't realize it. They walk around and they're all, it's like a herd of sheep. They're all going the same way about the same thing, doing the same things for years and years after year after year, religiously up here. Year after year after year, mama did it and daddy did it and brothers did it. And they're all doing the same thing. And they have more, they have more funerals in the church than they do healings. Do you think that I'm being mean? I'm not being mean. I'm, I'm telling people across America and around the world just the way it is. If you don't wake up, you're going to see an onslaught of this kind of stuff that is so out, just absolutely off the wall. It's going to blow you away. You guys get anything out of this? Yeah. One more little story. I went into Reno. There was a girl there. She was having all kinds of problems in her marriage. I'm telling you, honest to God, flaky and an eight-legged ape. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. I said, can I, she goes, can you come over to our house? I was almost kind of afraid to go over there. Yeah. Well, she's, now she's born again, spirit-filled, and had been a Christian for 20-something years. Right? So I go over to her house. I walk in her house. You know what I saw? I saw cupboards all the way around her house filled with these knickknacks. You know what these knickknacks were? She, she collected unicorns. That was her hobby, collecting unicorns. She says, Pastor Tom, what is wrong with us and our marriage and my spiritual life? I can't figure it out. I said, do you see all these unicorns? you know that's an occultic figure? She goes, oh, but I've been collecting those unicorns for years. I said, I know. How's your spiritual life been for years? She looked at me and the lights kind of went on. She goes, you mean to tell me that this is something? I said, you're going to have to get rid of those unicorns. You know how much money I spent on unicorns? I said, well, it's not worth it. Constantly sick, her husband's a flake. Constantly just fighting. Thing. Every day was, what, what, her Christian life was horrible. You know, she got a hold of what I said. She, she went out and threw the unicorn. To her credit, did you know that lady became a prophetess of God and had churches? Amen. Her spiritual life went, whoosh. I mean, she took off like a Roman candle after that. It was just the fact that she needed a little bit of knowledge about some of these things. Amen. Amen. 
Well, Pastor Tom, what's, what's, what's some of the, um, what's some of the uh, uh, symptoms of, of, of what possibly could be? How many know when I'm dealing with one subject here? How many know this is not the whole picture? Right. Please. <laughs> so don't go out and say, hey, Pastor Tom says everything's related to this. No, it's not. This is one area. I'm dealing with one area right now. But it could be. Now, what are some of the symptoms? Recurring bad dreams. Sudden chronic illness. Insomnia. Unusual sleeplessness. Behavioral problems. Relational problems in marriage. Confusion and fighting in the home. Of course, that's pretty normal for most people, but that could cause it. Lack of peace. Restless and disturbed children. Unexplained illness. Unexplained bondage to sin. Hooked on some kind of sin that you just can't seem to get rid of, you know. Ghosts. Seeing dead relatives. Do you know how many people have told me, oh, my mother-in-law appeared to me, she just, or my mother appeared to me, she just died, and I was so happy, and I had to tell them, uh-uh. Because they said they're, they're having wrapping on the walls, and their beds are flying around, and everything else. i got to go over there and tell them this. That's not your dead mother. That's a demon. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And then they would... We'd pray over it and get, her, get them straight away and it would stop every time. Every time. Poltergeist. Noise. Flying stuff around the room. Does that really happen or is that just all made up? No, it really happens, unfortunately. If you don't believe me, ask Julia. Okay. Everybody say foul odors. Say foul odors. Now, sometimes that can be the septic tank. <laughs> How many got one of those? I do. I came home one day and I had a real foul odor and it wasn't the demon. Yeah. It backed up in there. Yeah. An atmosphere of heaviness. Say heaviness. heaviness. Kind of like what was in here today. Change in temperatures in the home. I got to check that out. Nausea. Constant headaches. Nausea. Those are just some of the things that I've seen that were connected to this kind of activity. Well, Pastor Tom, what are the things I look for? You have to go and you have to, you have to study a little bit. You have to find out what you should have and what you shouldn't have in your room and in your house and what you let your kids watch and all that kind of stuff. Then what you have to do is you have to pray over it. Because I've had some people that got really angry with me about this message and said, you know, my, my, my I was, I know I'm going a little bit over my time, but I don't really care about television here. You can cut it off for television here, but just keep it rolling for the website. Everybody say amen. amen. So there's a lot more you watch the website than they do TV up here. I imagine they really love me here, right, in television. <laughs> so anyway, here we, we had, a, we had a, this one guy who came to me here, over here in Kiwani where I live, and, and they said, you know, we have, we've been uh, tormented by ghosts and stuff for years, 20-something years. Think everywhere we go follows us. I mean, weird stuff wrapping on the walls, beds flying around, you know, the appearances of all this stuff, and, you know, all the horror movie stuff. They said, can you, ha can you help us? I said, sure. If you let me help you, you got to do what I tell you to do. So we went in there and prayed over them. I counseled them a little bit, got them filled with the Holy Ghost. How many know that's important? They've been, they were baby, baby Christians, real baby Christians. And uh, I said to them, I said, okay, I got to, you know, I'll go take a look through your house. They understood the principle I just told you about. I'm making the sh long story short. We went in. I couldn't find much. They'd already uh, understood some things that people had told them. So they were trying to do this, but they just weren't getting, getting it done. So anyway, I said, where are all these manifestations coming from most of the time? Well, there was a room and it was connected with this wall. I just looked over there and there was a, one of those Indian, what do they call them things? Dream catchers on the wall. I said, uh, how long you had that? Oh, that was given to me by my, my, my it ran in their family. And, um, my dad, that's, a, that's my dad's dream. You know, he gave that to me. That's been in the family for years. I said, that's your problem right there. You're going to have to throw that away. She went, Ugh. my dad gave that to me. I said, yeah, do you want to be tormented? I said, that, that'll come right through that. Yeah, I've, seen Christian with those th I've seen Christians with those things in their cars. Some, I've, I've been picked up at the airport and taken to the church to preach and a guy had that in their car a bunch of times so I said you've got to get rid of that if you don't get rid of that they will not leave if you get rid of that you'll never have a problem to their credit they took it down as hard as it was for her and she burnt that thing out there and she ne they never had another manifestation 
Sometimes it's something so simple. Did you guys get anything out of that? I love you guys. Care about you. This stuff is serious. And when Tim comes, he'll, I'm sure he'll, he'll bring you to another notch. How come you're talking about all this right now? We're going through a season of talking about this. Then we'll go into something a little bit mellower. <laughs> I know this, is, this stuff, I don't really like doing this, but I got to do it. Because people all over America, yeah. Christians, I tell you honestly, some of them are so unknowledgeable about some of this stuff. It is absolutely, and man, my generation, you know, um, the guys who taught me, we understood all this stuff right off, immediately. <laughs> I found out myself, because my wife had all that in her luggage when she started manifesting, trying to kill me like psycho and all that kind of stuff. I mean, man, when your little wife growls at you like a wolf, you know something's wrong. And I'm trying to get the demons coming out of her and, she, and they won't come out and we're trying everything. We're, we're binding, we're loosening, we're, we're putting oil on her head, slapping her down with WD-40 and <laughs> pleading the blood and everything else. And she, <laughs> my wife, a little, she's 100 pounds, 115 pounds soaking wet. I mean, that's, that's foul. And my, I called my pastor up. I said, you know, I think my wife has demons. He says, that's PMS. I said, I don't think so. That's what he told me. He says, that happens to all new, new men when they get married. You know, you don't have to understand. There's a time where you go golfing. He, he gave me this whole thing, you know. I said, no. I said, no. You've got to come over here. He comes over there and he goes, that's demons. I said, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> it's not funny. It's, it's funny now. It wasn't funny then. I was frightened. To, I didn't know what to do. I was buying and listening. I knew my authority. I knew that the devil couldn't do that, but nothing was getting any better. You know, it was horrible, folks. She's chopping up salary for, she'd be normal for a little bit sometimes. She'd be chopping salary with a knife. Next thing I know, I turn around, she's coming at me with a knife, and her eyes are wild, like psycho. Have you ever seen that movie? Mm -hmm. I grabbed her hand, had to push my wife down, and take away a knife. Now, you can't sleep, because you don't know if your wife's going to get the cleaver. She not, remembers none of this. Well, see what had happened when my wife was born in Central America, Panama, Central America. You all know Stella, right? She'll cast the devil out of you now. <laughs> but she was born in Central America. Down there, you know, she was baptized in the Catholic Church, which is bad enough, by the way. That's all just occultism. And uh, she, but they took her over to the witch doctor, Santeria. And they baptized her with blood and called these spirits down there to protect her life. Well, she moved in with me. Here's, here's my little wife, moves in with the Apostle Paul, praying in tongues more than y'all, running around the house, quoting the word. I tell you, there was a clash. Those things came out, you know, and thank God, God let me go through the honeymoon okay, but after that, I don't know, God's merciful, but after that, this started happening. And I, and I finally came to the end of my rope because it was so horrible what had happened to me. And I'm, I'm saying this because maybe somebody didn't see this last time. It was so horrible. For three days and three nights, I couldn't sleep. And I thought I was going to go crazy because voices would come to my mind. Voices. I was hearing a man's voice. Men were talking to me in my ears. You're crazy. She's crazy. You're all going crazy. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill all your family. You got into this cult. That's what, they, that's what the voices said. You're into this, you know, these charismatic cults. No, it's voices and voices. A lot of people believe that stuff. Voices and voices. And I'm, sitting, I'm fighting this stuff. And I said, Lord, I got to have an answer. You got to tell me what's going on. He says to me, luggage. I go over there and I kick the luggage out of, the, out of, her, out of her closet. And I bring it over. I'll open up her luggage from Panama. I, never, I didn't know she had any luggage. I didn't even know she had luggage. I open up this luggage. She's got all kinds of occulty items in there. I'm on upside down crosses and hair of the sheep and the saints and the, all the witchcraft items that you can think of and different weird stuff. I mean, wild stuff. I've never seen some of that stuff. Pins and needles and, you know, I took all of this stuff because they sent it over with her, you know. I took all this stuff and burned it and she was set free. Hallelujah. Amen. Got my wife back. How many know God is good? So I have a special love for this particular subject. You can see why, right? Stand to your feet.